changed. We're cousins again. But we know we won't be in a little while. Well, it may be a little longer than we thought, than we hoped. But it's only a question of time, Richard. Your mind can be quite at ease about me. I'm sure Cousin John is quite right. It really is better for you, for the time being, to be free, completely free, to establish yourself. fall in love with anyone else. I hope you're not reproaching yourself. What else could you say to them? I can't believe Richard will harbour a grudge. I've never known him to. Richard? No, of course not. He'll, he'll come round again. No, I wasn't thinking about Richard. Although something he said... Uh, he's right, of course. I, I have not known. I, I cannot speak from personal experience when I talk to him about the love of man and wife. And, Maybe he thinks the less of me for that. In any case, he feels that I advise him from weak ground on that score, and then maybe so. I, mean, I don't regret my unmarried life. It's simply the way things have happened, and then things could change. How can we know what will happen? Now, I've been thinking that you ought to know as much as I can tell you about your own history. It's very little, next to nothing. When you spoke to me before about that, I said I had nothing to ask you. Yes, but that's not the same as whether I have something I feel I'm duty-bound to tell you. If you think so, then you must. I think you probably have vague impressions from your childhood that must worry you. Some sense of disadvantage. One of my earliest memories is of hearing these words from the woman who brought me up. Your mother is your disgrace. Your mother is your disgrace, and, and you, you were hers. hers. The time will come, and soon enough, when you'll understand this better. And you'll feel it as only a woman can. It would have been better if you'd never been born. I owe it to you, I think, Mr. Jarndyce, that as yet I've never felt that shame. From the day I came under your protection, I felt quite safe from any taunt or maltreatment. <clears throat> Nine years ago, I received a letter from a woman living in seclusion, written with a stern passion and power which made it unlike any other letter I'd ever read. It told me of a child, an orphan girl then 12 years old. And her position was described in much the same cruel terms as the words you remember. It told me that the writer had bred the child in secrecy from her birth and had blotted out all trace of her existence. And that if the writer were to die before the child became a woman, she would be left entirely friendless, nameless, and unknown. It asked if I would, in that case, finish what the writer had begun. But you did it in such a different way from her. I felt concerned for the little girl, 
living her darkened life under the precepts of a distorted religion which clouded the woman's mind, convincing her that the child was required to expiate her, an offence of which she was quite innocent. I replied to the letter. I, I agreed I would never attempt to meet the writer, and I credited my lawyer, Mr. Kenge, to act between us. The woman said of her own accord that her name was an assumed one and that the name she'd given the child was equally fictitious. She said that she was the child's aunt, inasmuch as there could be any ties of blood in such a case. She said she would never disclose anything more beyond this, and she never did. You, of course, were the child. I don't know your real name any more than I ever knew hers. Well, now I've told you all I can. I was afraid it might distress you. Can you see a likeness? What do you say, young man from Kensington Cowboys? Is that a likeness of a certain young lady? It's very like, wouldn't you say? Uncommon, uncommon similar. very same. It could be, Croc. Oh. But they ain't, are they? It says Lady Honoria Deadlock. <laughs> You've an eye for an eye, though, Crook, you old devil. Favourite reading of the night time, is it? The Galaxy Gallery of British Beauty. <laughs> Sweetens your dreams, does it? Eh? Honoria. Deadlock. Barbary. Sean Dice. <laughs> Nothing found. When the law writer died upstairs. Nothing found. To say who he was. Or who, who knew him. Nothing found that day. But before. Someone might, I dare say, Crook. More, you say? <laughs> Letters. It's names of the count. With letters. I can copy. 
it from memory. What's it say? Speak it out. Tell me how to say it. Mm. I'd say... Horden. 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 Would you buy? on you, Judy, I'm Paulie, Brimstone idiot, hold me up, Judy. Says Judy. It's too much for what they've done. George! George! Will you come and talk to me, George? <laughs> A fine place you have here. <laughs> I hope you're prospering. <laughs> yes. You look the part. <laughs> yes, George. Very sprightly. <laughs> you could lead the troops still. <laughs> I'm sure you could. <gasps> Careful! <clears throat> You're always such good company, George. I'm glad you think so. Always did. So. This is a friendly visit, is it? Not unfriendly, George. <laughs> Shake me up. Are we private? Makes me nervous. Phil, don't mind us. Right you are, Commander. You always have him guard your door. Hmm? Wise precaution when you've got valuables. Go on, price me up. Now, George. If I'm ever a day in arrears, you'd have me sold up, wouldn't you? Me? Never. Never. But my friend in the city who I've got to lend you the money, he might, it's a fact. He's done it before. No fire, George. Judy, rub my legs. It's 
such a pity you weren't able to help us concerning the captain. And when I say us, I mean my friend in the city and one or two others in the same way of business. I figured that much. When you came to me after that advertisement we put in the newspapers. <laughs> you witches broom stick, you break me bones. Then, George, you'd have been made, made. So you say. You'll regret it. Your friend in the city, he'll be hard on me, will he? Why not help us, George? Because you and your friend took me in. You advertised that Captain Orden would hear something to his advantage if he could be found. Well? Well, it wouldn't have been much to his advantage to find himself clapped into prison by the old money-lending trade of London, would it? How do you know that? Some of his rich relations might have paid up for him. Had he taken us in, pounds and pounds he owed us all. I could strangle him! Judy, shake me up. Anyway, Captain Orton's dead. How do you know? Convinced of it. He'd have turned up by now. I'd have heard. Come closer, George. Let me be your friend. Stand back, you streak of brimstone. We can help each other. I've been applied to by a lawyer, a famous one named Talkinor. Very famous, I promise you. He wants something I think you can provide. He wants to see something in Captain Alden's handwriting. He won't keep it. Just wants to see it and compare it with some paper in his possession. What's his interest in the captain? Don't know. He came to me like you did after seeing the advertisement. Anything to do, George, an order, a list of stores, a list of names. You pay. Hmm? You got it, I know you have. You serve with him. Yes. Shake me up. Got his signature? A million of them. No use. The lawyer wants writing. If he's dead, where's the arm? Hmm? Now you do have something, don't you? Hmm? I can see it. I can see the answer in your honest trooper's face, George. I can see it. I can see it. I might have, and I might not. Be neighborly and help yourself. I'll need to know more. Come and see the lawyer. Hmm? I might, when I've thought about it. Bill, give. Mr. Smallweed, a hand. Get him to be careful. Do the sensible thing, George. <coughs> careful! Oh, my dear Lord. Judy! Play the question. Peace be on this house, on the master thereof, on the mistress thereof, on the young maidens, and on the young men. My friends, why do I wish for peace? What is peace? Is it war? No. Is it strife? No. Is it lovely and gentle and beautiful and serene and joyful? Oh, yes. Therefore, my friends, I wish for peace upon you and yours. Amen. 
Amen indeed, Mr. Snugsby. Amen, my friend. Now, what is this which we have laid before us? Refreshment. And do we need refreshment? We do. And why do we need refreshment, my friends? Because we are but mortal. Because we are but sinful. Because we are but of the earth. Could we walk, my friends, without strength? We could not. Our knees would double up and our ankles would turn over. And we would fall to the ground. Then let us partake of the good things set before us from which we derive the strength that is necessary for our limbs. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Jack Panther, please. Go away! Go away! Policeman! Downstairs! Guster! Well, my little woman, I have to attend the shop. Reverend Chadband, Mrs. Chadband, I, I, I regret this unfortunate interruption. Pray, excuse me for a moment. We are all vessels, my friend. I, a vessel of the Lord, and you of commerce. And we must sail to our duty wherever it lies. A duty unfulfilled is a voyage founded on the rocks. I'm always moving on. I'll be moving on. on and on. Go. Let go, come on. Where can I move to? Nowhere else left. You will move on or I'll take you in custody. When, sir? Don't come now, that. You'll move on. Bless my heart. What's the matter here? We won't move on, sir. Where to? On. You move on. Well, really, Constable, the boy does have a fair question. It seems, doesn't it? A question of where, you know. Well, my instructions don't go to that, sir. He moves on when I tell him to. As long as he moves, you say? Moves on. Well, I'm sure he will. Do you know this boy, sir? No, he doesn't. I love my little woman. Uh, Constable, yes, I do know this boy. I shook these two half crowns out of him. He says you gave him one once after the inquest on a man who died at Crooks. Did I? Uh, Yes, I, I believe. <clears throat> Perhaps. Yes. Very well. But what about these two? Listen to this story. Well, come on, speak up. Tell the gentleman. Then what's left, Mr. Slagsby? I have a sovereign. Give me by a lady in a veil. Who said she was a servant? But she weren't one. I know that. She told me to show him Mr. Crook's house and this house. And a burial place. And she kept asking what I know about the man who did the law writing. I couldn't tell her any more than I told you. But she still gave me the sovereign, like you give me half a crown. I don't know why, because I don't know nothing. What colour was her veil? Light? Dark? Dark. How tall was this lady? I think the boy's telling the truth, Constable. Guppy, Mr. Snagsby. William Guppy. Of Kenshin Carboys. Lincoln's in. Mr. Guppy, yes, of course, I do remember. <laughs> Kendron Carboys, my love. Very important customer. <laughs> the truth, you think, do you? Think, Constable. My legal training tells me so.
If I don't lock him up this time, will you see your moves on? <gasps> no! My love. My little woman. Yes, Constable. I'll engage to that. On, mind. It's either on or locked up. Stand there. Move, move, he sticks to the tail like cobbler's wax. Mm. Beats anything that's come our way at Kenjin Carboys. Mrs. Chadband has known Kenjin Carboys for many years, Mr. Guppy. Oh, you don't say so. For years. Before I married my present husband. Were you? A party to anything, ma'am? Not a party. Acquainted with somebody who was? No. Well, not exactly. Not exactly. How about acquainted with a lady or gentleman who had some transactions with Kenjin Carboys? Well... Aha, uh -huh, now. Man or woman? Neither. A child, ma'am? <laughs> now you have it. <laughs> Name of the child, ma'am. Before your time, I would think, Mr. Guppy. A lady I was companion to died, and I was left in charge of the child in the house before she was put out in life by Kenj and Carboys. Name of, ma'am? Name of Esther Summerson. Miss Summerson? You don't say? There was no miss about it in my time. It was Esther do this and Esther do that, and Esther did it. And as for the name Summerson, huh. well... Ma'am, if you'd do me the honour, uh, Mr. Chadband, sir, with your permission, would you take a turn on the landing, Mrs. Chadband? Oh, matters of interest here. To Kenjin Carboys. Offer Mr. Chadband some more tea or a glass of wine or something? The Reverend Chadband does not consume alcoholic drink. Oh, running stream of sparkling joy to be a soaring human boy. Stop. 
Nothing to fear. I know nothing more. Only what I told you. No harm, Joe. Would you know the lady's voice if you heard it, Joe? I might. Was it like this? I will speak as long as you like if you are not sure. Was this the voice? Never. It was a lady's voice. What you saw of her face, Joe? Any likeness here? No. It was a lady. Mademoiselle. Thank you. It was good of you to give me your time. I'm obliged that you have asked no questions. It is not my place to ask Mr. Tulkinghorn questions, sir. A favor, perhaps, I may beg. You will do me the kindness, Mr. Tulkinghorn, of remembering that I am not at present in employment. Your distinguished recommendation would be a great favor. May I depend upon that, sir? You may. Thank you, sir. Good night, sir. You've been very helpful. Thank you for coming to me with your story. Recollecting your interest in the law writer, sir. Uh, an interest of sorts. Uh, there may be a connection with some other matter I may be attending to. Not a matter of such importance that you should concern yourself further, Snagsby. Thank you. Or mention it anywhere else. That's well understood, sir. Uh, my little woman is, uh, not to put too fine a point upon it, inquisitive. Uh, but my visits here are and will be unmentioned to her. She, um, she will employ her active mind upon every individual thing she can lay hold of, whether it concerns her or not. <laughs> Especially not. <laughs> Good night, Snagsby. Good night, sir. <clears throat> Joe! Not a word of this. Not a word. Mr. Summerson, as you say, your ladyship. On that occasion in Lincolnshire, shortly before the Christmas just gone. Did it strike your ladyship that she was... like anybody? Like? Like your ladyship's family. Oh, like yourself, your ladyship. I wish to say, your ladyship, that Miss Summerson's image is imprinted on my heart. It came as a great shock, your ladyship, to find a picture of Miss Summerson recently in a publication dated before she was born. Of course, it was not her portrait. It was yours. 
the lightness was so close. I think you'd better sit down, Mr. Guppy. Oh. Thank you, Your Ladyship. But perhaps for the moment I'll stand, if I may. We, in the legal profession, have a tendency to think better on our feet. There is a mystery about Miss Summerson's birth and bringing up. If I could clear this mystery for her, suppose I could prove she was well related, that she has the honour of belonging to perhaps a remote branch of your ladyship's family. And therefore, has a right to be made a party in the case of Jarndyce and Jarndyce. For instance. Well, then I would have done her a service she could not deny. And then she might look on my proposal to her with a more favourable eye. I repeat, Your Ladyship, Miss Esther Summerson's image is imprinted. Imprinted. On my heart. <laughs> oh, thank you, pardon, I'm sure. <laughs> As to uh Names and appearances, Your Ladyship. <clears throat> I've recently discovered the real name of the lady who brought up Miss Summerson as a child. The lady's name was Barbary. Miss Barbary. <laughs> Same as your maiden name. By coincidence, your ladyship. I also know from the same source of information that Miss Esther's real name is not Summerson, but Horden, your ladyship. My informant, your ladyship, is a former companion to Miss Barbary, so I think she is not to be doubted as to names. Names and appearances, Your Ladyship. A law writer died some few months back at the house of a person called Crook. Died in much distress. I know that law writer's name. Horden, Your Ladyship. Like Miss Esther's name. Horden. What is that to me? A strange thing. A strange thing. A lady's been seen going round, spying out all this Horden's old haunts. Spied him out right to his grave. I saw her myself. But I didn't know it at the time. She had a boy with her. I can lay hand on him any time. If you should want to hear him tell his story. Please stand back a little, Mr Guppy. Why have you come to me? Horden left some letters. Personal. From a lady. Oh my God. I should have them in my possession. Very soon. Then I could bring them here. 
Shall I do that, your ladyship? You may. If you choose. Or take them somewhere else. You may bring them, if you please. Thank you, your ladyship. You misunderstand, your ladyship. I could not accept anything of that kind. My interest is in Miss... Esther. I hope you will assist me there. I'm not dishonourable, I hope. Your ladyship. Good night, your ladyship. Apologize to the court, Mulan. Asks you to take into account his youth and inexperience. Has given assurance of no disrespect intended. Is now fully cognizant of a lack of responsibility shown in needless procrastination. <clears throat> Submit, Mulan. Reasonable to plead youthful ignorance. Ah, no excuse in law, Mulan, but offered in mitigation. Aware of demands on the court's time, regret necessity to press for a decision. <laughs> May appear an importunate applicant, apologize to the court for any improper haste, begs the court for a sympathetic hearing, promises no further frivolous submission in the case, obliged, Mala. No objection, no objection, Mala. objection if you please, Mala. <clears throat> The appellant really must learn that he cannot trifle with time in the way he has, certainly not the time of this court. Mr. Richard Carstone appears to me a vexatious and capricious infant, and it is time he learned to know his own mind. His latest choice of career may well assist him in that direction, with his special emphasis on disciplined conduct. I shall give the court's assent to this application. Mr. Carstone may join the army. All right. <laughs> Wasting time. Some joke coming from this court. Huh? Yeah. Not famous for its comic. Turn of mine. I'm in the horse guards, Esther. Miss Summerson! Miss Summerson! Miss Summerson! Forgive me, a bold application. My friend, Gridley, the man from Shropshire, he needs help. Mr. Jandice, forgive this approach. What's happened? He's in hiding. There's a warrant out against him, uttering threats again. He will do it. And he's ill. Very ill. I thought they could never break my heart, Mr. Chandois. I wanted to die on my feet, fighting them. There in that place. But I'm worn out. I seem to break down all at once. I don't want them to know 
how it ended with me. Tell them I defied them to the last. I do in spirit. You turned them. They'll never forget you. Remember the first time you came to Chancery? How you threatened them. <laughs> Removed from the gallery two and three times a week. But they couldn't stop. There's a tie of many years suffering between us two. And it is the only tie I ever had on earth that Chancery hasn't broken. the door. But if the officers had come for him, would you, would you have opposed them or fought them? I can't answer that, sir. It didn't happen. Mr. Gridley asked me for a bed to die in. I could see that. I hadn't looked any further. Harboring Gridley, you were already going against the law. Did you know that? I know the law had gone against him. He was badgered by it. He'd come here and pay for 50 shots. Twice over sometimes. And fire away like a whole troop. Safety valve. I don't know how many lawyers' faces he saw on my walls. I can't say I'm over fond of the law. Nor I. It's supposed to protect. But what if it doesn't and afflicts instead? Should we fight it? Conscience would say yes. I believe I would for those dear to me. Miss Flight, are you well enough to go home? The last judgment, no right of appeal. Put up the next. <laughs> 